press red button or do I don't have to do oh. anything? No, no, we, we are live, ma'am. Okay. We are live. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Carwan. I'm Ishan Sharma, as you all know. And I'll start with the dedication page of the book that we are going to discuss this evening. Don't let the language slip away. Keep a hold on it. So today we are here to discuss a book by Professor Anvita B. Voices from the Lost Horizons. And if I can hold it like this and you all can see this cover. And Thank to you. discuss the book, we have the chair for the session, Dr. Swikrita Paul Kumar. And though they don't need any introduction, we all have seen them on Rikta and on other platforms. Professor Anvita Abbi is an Indian linguist and scholar of minority languages, known for her study on tribal languages and other minority languages of South Asia. The government of India honored her in 2013 by awarding her the Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian honor, for her contributions to the field of linguistics. Anvita Abbi is credited with extensive research on the, on the six language families in India and the languages and culture of the great Andamanese, which she did as a part of the Endangered Languages Documentation Project. I think your voice is breaking. I can't hear you, nor can I. Video is all visible. I think there's some neck issue. Excuse me, Ishan. Uh, oh, I think he's joining again. Yeah, yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, I can hear yeah. you. I think there is a problem with the net that at that end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's joining again. Yeah. So can you see me yeah. now? I'm really sorry for that. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll start with the introduction again. And Dr. Abby, as you all know, is an Indian linguist and scholar of minority languages, known for her study on tribal languages and other minority languages of South Asia. The government of India honored her in 2013 by awarding her the Padma Shri, the fourth highest civilian honor, for her contributions to the field of linguists. Uh, Professor Abby is credited with extensive research on the six language families in India and the languages and cultures of the Great Andamanese, which she did as a part of the Endangered Languages Documentation Project on Vanishing Voices of the Great Andamanese at SOS University of London. The chair today, Dr. Sikrita Paul Kumar, is a known Indian poet, critic, and academician. She is the chief editor of Cultural Diversity, Linguistic Plurality, and Literary Traditions of India, a textbook prescribed by the University of Delhi for course use in its BA Honours program. As director of UNESCO project on the culture of peace, she edited Mapping Memories, a volume of cultural Urdu, Urdu, Urdu short stories from India and Pakistan. She has published several collections of books in English, including Un Untitled, Without Margin, Holes of Silence and Oscillations, her two bilingual collections are Poems Come Home, translated by Gulzar, published by Harper Collins. So, without further ado, a nervous me welcomes you all and in formally invite and welcome our speaker, Professor Anvita Abhi, and our chair, Dr. Kumar, to this panel. Over to you, Dr. Kumar, and I'll see you after the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ishan. Um, thank you for making this possible. Thank you, Karman, and thank you also, uh, Niyogi, Trisha, Niyogi, and everybody else uh, who have made this possible because uh, this is quite an opportunity for me personally because I've always been wanting that um, Anvita's, uh, you know, kind of competence in just not just linguistics but also in the context of a sensitivity to literature should um, be brought together somewhere and I 
have always been wanting a dialogue with her, even formally, so that um, you know we see how language and literature, unlike the universities that we teach in usually, um, the way these two subjects are, two disciplines are divorced from each other, um, it's not very pleasant to be operating as um, uh, a linguistics professor without a base in literature and a literature person not really having any orientation in linguistics. However, thank you for having done this wonderful book, Anvita. And I think uh, even the title itself, when you you know just read the title, it's very poetic. I mean, <laughs> the whole question, yeah. The well, I'm a daughter of a poet. Maybe that's what it keep brought out. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, sure. So Voices from the Lost Horizon. And uh, I think it, it, it speaks for a lot that you've done inside between the two, between the covers, because you do see that there is a very beautiful effort and a very persistent and competent and with a lot of discipline, the way you have excavated a certain kind of uh, collective consciousness. And I'm sure it's not been easy at all, this research. And what I like about the book is that um, there is a certain kind of uh, entry point that you make in it for, for all of us. You know, there are there's an entry point, the way you talk about the way research was conducted, how it happened, the way your passion got translated into a certain kind of a vision, and how these stories and songs came together and ultimately, it is not just as a linguist that you appear at the end of the book, but you also seem to have put together with a vision a tremendous amount of research, uh, which is making sense through and through narratives. So I think before we go on into this, I'm just wondering, you, a North Indian, a person who is basically entrenched in Hindi and English, and then going to Andaman Islands and going to be working on what you call the great Andamanese, um, which I now and understand after having read the book, that it's really the, this particular language family that you are talking about, great Andamanese, is actually not just one language, but it's a mm -hmm. it's multiplicity of languages being brought That's together. Right. Right. And in itself, it's a collectivity. <clears throat> there is a diversity there as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, can you tell us why do you think of giving it a one common name? What is the common thing between the the, the, the various languages that come together as the great Andamanese? Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Sukrita, for um, reading this book so thoroughly and appreciating my research uh, input that has gone into it. This is the very first book that I have done on oral tradition in any language, though I have been working on tribal languages uh, since I joined JNU in 1976. And I must have worked on more than 1995 languages of India so far, including large number of tribal languages. But somehow linguists have a very myopic view, you know, they we do the grammar, we do the dictionary and we think we have achieved everything. But when you deal with endangered languages, especially those languages which are on the brink of extinction, which have become moribund, so they are not, there's no intergenerational transfer. Whatever is left has to be documented. And Sukrita, you being a person from literature must re you realize this, that language is used in every realm of life, be it in love or abuse or scolding or anything. So linguist job becomes more tedious and more challenging and demanding that we record each and everything. So when I started working on these languages, they were already known as the languages of the Great Andaman because Andaman has two big islands. One is known as Great Andaman and the other is known as Little Andaman. In the Great Andaman, uh, these are also sets of actually 250 islands, but they're so close to each other, they look like a whole uh, mass of earth or mass of land interconnected. The languages spoken in the Andama, Great Andaman are known as Great Andamanese languages. And just uh, uh, the the just before the millennia, you see, there were 10 different languages were spoken in the Great Andaman, known as the 10 different varieties of the Great Andamanese languages. When I reached the island, I realized that the languages which were spoken in the northern part of the Great Andaman. They were, those speakers were distributed, fragmented here and there. 
the government of india and very rightly and wisely collected those people and put them in a small island called strait island because and i have I had a long talk with the professor t and pandit the anthropologist who was one of the team members who did this and other people and they were saying that the great and the mountains were in very bad shape some were beggars some were living in japanese bunkers some were you know loitering around the seashore so they we realized that they will become extinct unless we protect them and save them so these people were collected and put in strait island strait island is 53 nautical miles away from the city of port blair the capital city so one has to go there by boat or by small ships and this is an island which is a very tiny little island perhaps in the radius of 5 to 7 kilometers miles sorry not kilometers and the andamanis the great andamanis stay there so when i met them i realized there were four different language speakers living there however all of them had forgotten their language or languages you see these languages were bo sare khora and jero now when i started working i thought if i give any one of the names to these languages that i'm working i will be unnecessarily empowering one community in one language over the others to avoid that <clears throat> i called it pga present great andamanis to give a conglomeration because the the present great andamanis is a kind of a mixed language kind of a koine as we say the lexicon that is the word that derived from four different languages bo sare khora and jero but the grammar is based on jero you see mm. so <clears throat> as linguists know most of the languages do develop by koines even english has you know the grammar of english but it has so many words from different languages so mm. calling it a khora language or sare language or bo or even a jero language so the grammar of jero would would have been unjustified and that's why i called it great and devanis so this present great and devanis is a language of name of a fam and i also could identify this as a separate language family and my research goes little back uh, so kuta when i was first introduced to the andaman islands in 2000 2001 at that time i did comparative study of three different tribal languages of the andaman onge who live in south uh, uh, little andaman and great andamanis who live in the uh, strait island as well as they also live in port blair city and jarawa who live in the western periphery of the great andaman and my comparative study brought out a very big evidence in fact i was very much assured that this constitute a separate language family which has nothing nothing whatsoever to share either linguistically or culturally or anthropologically with onge and jarawa so mm -hmm. i think identified i was happy to identify this as a sixth language family and mm -hmm. to get you little more on this you would be happy to know that in 2005 the population geneticists brought out the paper in science proving my <laughs> uh, proving mm -hmm. my results that yes the onge and jarawa belong to different haplogroup than the great andamanis so yes. they were a different people you know so and since they lived in isolation all throughout their life till the british has made this as a penal colony the languages were more or less intact retaining the archaic structures so now great andamanis is a sixth language family of india first so what was very interesting was to see how you uh, talk about you know that there is a certain kind of uh, linkage one between the other however if you see that kind of you know linkage and you follow it out then both the ends do not match each other which is very interesting so if you go to the two extremes of these four like four or five languages or 10 languages is it yeah, is it 10, 10 languages 10, i think it's 10, 10 yeah so um, yeah it's 10 languages so it's very interesting to see though one language is linked with the other but by the time you come to the 10th language the first and the 10th are quite different yes it's very yes. interesting, it's very interesting so, because yeah, you know yeah. these languages were mutually intelligible to each other and as you said the there were two languages that adjacent to each other had the mutual intelligibility but yes. once you go, travel from north to center center to south they become yeah. unintelligible the best example sukrita you can take from indo aryan languages 
you take yes. a train from uh, let's say Odisha huh? mm -hmm. and move all the way to Bombay as yes. the train will pass through the railway stations you yes. see mutual intelligibility from yes. Odia and Bangla Bangla and then you know it goes on and yeah, on yeah yeah you come to the Hindi belt and then you go on towards the uh, east and you realize yes sorry the west and you realize that you know it's, it's decreasing it's less basically you are in a different it's, it's almost thing. like uh, it's almost like what you know some uh, you must be terming it as a certain kind of an eco-cultural cartography that you end up doing linguistically yes you know, it's a yes. cartography of a kind it's, it's yes. very very interesting <laughs> and we in literature are also very very keen to follow that up because it's not mm -hmm. just language mm -hmm. because language after all is a carrier of a whole culture a worldview and um, so on so a, a history a collective consciousness and so on so how does this dynamic work i think for us also it's very interesting so what better than you know using narratives using mm -hmm. songs mm -hmm. because uh, i mean one of the things i am very keen to know from you is because after all you know you have worked on you have actually narrativized you know and elicited from people, couple of people, two, three people, who fortunately you were able to meet and you were able to get it out of them. One was now and now junior. Yes, yes, yes. Now yes. junior, yes. and the other one is Boa Senior. Yes. Now, yes. see, if you had not excavated in the way that you did, and I use that word very consciously, <laughs> you know, yeah. the way the excavation of the mind happens, because <laughs> one of them actually told you. I, I don't remember anything. Yes. And he seemed to be the only one or two from amongst the two people who knew that language, right? Yes. Yeah, so he, he was my guru. In yeah. fact, I taught, he taught me the language. Absolutely. Yes. So there, there has been a certain kind of not just linguistic amnesia, but a cultural amnesia. Oh, yes. And that amnesia probably comes through primarily through the kind of maybe intervention of modernity, intervention of development, education of the kind that we pursue. And this education actually uneducates or yeah. the, the people are unlearning whatever they have within themselves. That's so true. it's a very, very strange paradox. And see what we have done to ourselves in the name of being civilized, in the name of being modern or developed, yeah. highly developed. So. You know, it's that primitive or elemental wisdom that one is looking for. In that context, I think it becomes very significant that this work comes at this point of time. I'll just finish and want you to take over when I say that also there has been a certain kind of a hierarchy between, say, uh, writ the written being given priority yes. and the oral is seen as secondary you know, not not substantial material for educate to, to enter the field of education. So mm -hmm. this hierarchy also we should talk about at some point of time mm -hmm. because I think the the dialogue or the dialectic is a better word between the yeah. written and the oral yes. and then from the oral to the written and you know vice versa. It is mm -hmm. cyclic and it happens over centuries mm -hmm. it's been happening, mm -hmm. right? But we haven't acknowledged that. We don't mm -hmm. acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. So I think some of these things enter your text in, a, in, the, in the way you are narrating, in the way you have done the research. You have obviously taken cognition of these points mm -hmm. and therefore you have worked around it, you know, mm -hmm. you have worked around it. So I would like you to talk a little bit about it. Oh, I'm you so know. happy to hear you, Suprita, on this because you almost are on the same page as, as mm -hmm. I am. And mm -hmm. I'm very happy that you've stretched my sensitivities also. Mm -hmm. uh, on this to the first thing that you made uh, very clear which i also noticed the cult the cultural amnesia mm -hmm. and i realized <clears throat> when you lo lose your uh, heartland because these people were migrated from the northern mm -hmm. part of the andaman islands when you are uprooted from your <clears throat> place when you are uprooted from your belongings and the entire environment which is very very essential for language retention also you also these are the things which help you forget your language and as you know this great andamani's uh, tale is a tale of tales of uh, sexual subjugation political subjugation and cultural subjugation they were decimated because of the britishers wrong policy mm -hmm. 
and various things that will not go into the history with people who know that they were the most ill-treated people. So by the time when there were 6,000, 7,000 people at the beginning of the last century, they are now, when I reached the island, there were 26 of them only. Mm -hmm. So they were decimated to this extent in this scenario. Not only they forget their language, their, their environment, because language does not hang like, it hangs like a corpse on a tree without the context. The contextualization was lost. So naturally, cultural amnesia has to see things. And that made my work very challenging because to be very frank to the audience who are listening to this and to you, let me tell you, I have worked on a large number of languages, but I never worked on a dying language. Mm. you know back to this extent and mm. also mixed language so for example in this book most of the songs 99 percent of the songs are from boa senior and mm. boa senior sang in bo she did not sang she did not sing in any other language so people have the last documentation and maybe also the very first because nobody ever did it before me if i can intervene just a little bit because you know you talk about how um boa is boa senior mm -hmm. is a very very lonely person because yes. she's the only person speaking that language yes yes so i mean in you she finds a listener you know <laughs> and i can imagine the kind of you know intimacy that must have come up there oh, we were very intimate towards the end in the beginning she was very uh, curse uh, she used to curse us whenever she would see our face she says bar bar aa jate hain tang karte hain you know because mm -hmm. we wanted to help tell her please sing us a song and it was a very yeah. difficult situation she was living in a post tsunami relief camp so you can mm -hmm. imagine 40 people heard her in a one room how would they feel and they had they were uprooted again from Strait Island because Strait Island had this tsunami. So, you know, in that scenario, it was very difficult to extract a song. But mm -hmm. finally, when she gave in, maybe she realized that the, by singing, she's feeling better. It was like a balm to her mm -hmm. sorrows, you know. And you're very right, Sukrita, because she said, I have a very good video recording where she says, no one understands me. And that was the time when she made this statement with Ishan, which Ishan read and I have put it on my dedication page that hold on to the language, it, 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 don't let it slip away. Mm. You know, that mm. kind of she said. And it is true that when I learned her language, she would hold my hand. She would not let me go to Delhi or Port Blair from Strait Island, if I was there, she says, you are the only person who understands me. If you go, then whom will I talk to? And to be very frank, I did not speak her language. I only knew few words, which I used to throw at her of phrases. That alone made her happy. And mm. she said that my husband did not speak Bo, and she didn't have any children. So she had not spoken Bo for many years. Mm. And one of my team members, Abhishek, taught her talking to birds. Because wow. I and then he asked, why are you talking to birds? And she said, they are the only people who are the only creatures who understand me. I said, how can Bo and, uh, they understand Bo? And she says, don't you know, all the birds are great under monies. Then I talked to now Junior and I said, is it true? And he says, yes. And this is how I got my second story of creation taken, yes. given in this book, Maya Jiro Mithe, mm -hmm. which became a very popular story among the environmentalists because this story tells us that the, how Andamanis become birds. You see? Yes. That's why birds have so many names. In fact, this is how it started also. Because I asked In fact, now, they said, in fact uh, you know, someone says, one of them says, birds are our ancestors. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's what so they see that lineage out there, you know? So yeah, beautiful. and your senior said, you know, don't you know, that's why we don't eat birds. I mean, they are hunter and gatherers, but they mm. don't they don't hunt birds because they are their ancestors. ancestors. And mm -hmm. So she used to be talking to these birds. So this is what I'm saying. There was exactly. a cultural amnesia. And I realized there are many words in different languages which other people have forgotten. For example, this Rapuch word once I told you about, mm -hmm. which uh, I found out it is a word from Sare language. It's not in Jero. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there must be a word in Jero, similar word, but mm -hmm. nobody remembered. And that means... That is the reference term for the person who has lost his siblings. Mm -hmm. So this is very interesting. And this is how we bonded me and now Junior. Because once now told me that I am a Rapuch, 
And when I asked him why, who, why are you Rob? Which, and he says, because I've lost my brother, so I'm called mm -hmm. Rob. I said, I'm also Rob because I had lost my sister just a year ago before I met him. So this is so we both were Rob you know. Mm -hmm. So this is like a Mita with the, uh, the, the you know, that's a, a Fanishwatnath's Renu story, you know. Yes. Them, when they both mm -hmm. are Mitas, you know, there's something mm -hmm. similar. And yeah. he was flabbergasted. In fact, he was very angry with us that we speak a language, Hindi and English, where we have no word for a sibling, for a person yeah. who knows, uses his siblings. Because that also sort of gives, a, you know, gives out their worldview in a way. You yes. Know? For yeah. instance, you know, when you're doing translation between, say, an Indian language and we try to translate it into English, what mm -hmm. happens then? You know, how do we... We find it very difficult, particularly when it comes to kinship terms. Yes. How do you transfer them? How do yeah. you, you know, you can't yeah. keep saying paternal uncle and, you know, so on. Even sister-in-law. Really... The sister-in-law doesn't yeah. make any sense. The sister-in-law doesn't. The mm. moment you say bhabi, it immediately evokes so many yes. feelings and yes. intimacy yes. and which does not it evokes, evokes for perhaps for none of Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So it is. It shows that that particular language has a certain, you know, in the in the context yeah. of cultural and in familial kinship terms as yeah. well. How is one related to another? Yeah. You know, it actually yeah. shows that. Yeah. So uh, this in itself becomes an area of study in a very big way. So yeah. that is why their stories, when you come to their stories and how you got that out. What mm -hmm. I like about this book tremendously is that it's not as if you are just in a blind way telling the story. This is how it was told. <laughs> it's not just that. You go into the process, you yeah. tell the story, but you also go later on in the book, line by line, as it was told, literally. So I think it is somewhere establishing of certain kind of integrity and establishing the originality of the story as original as it can be in yes. the context of the oral domain. Thank you for pointing that out because that was my ulterior motive. One for linguists who would like to know actually these stories are also word to word translated which I have not given in the book but line to line translation I have given so they know the when you forget your language you also forget the coherence in the sense sometimes the person speaks the later incidents first and the first incident later yes. so this kind of continuity is discontinued but it's very important for discourse analysis people who are yes. involved in discourse analysis to know that in a dying language when a narration comes out what is what could be the possible sequences so, and Mita, that is also postmodern style <laughs> i see i see i didn't know that <laughs> okay i wish now Jodhia was there i could have understood really understand that yes <laughs> that is a postmodern style wow mm -hmm. i agree yes. <laughs> we must talk a little more about that those yeah. kinds of aesthetics so, yeah. so you know the these stories initially i was very frustrated because these i had to bind these stories in a coherence which is given of course is in the beginning of the book in english but when I gave them line by line, I realized that so many things he made, he thought was more important. So he first told me those things. And mm. what was secondary in importance maybe came later, or maybe he remembered later. So the, the entire elicitation process has been given in this book primarily to introduce linguists, the story writers, the narrators, the discourse analysts, and also people like you, who would like to get more deeper into these the unearthing the 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 psychosematic process of you know narrating something which they had lost for the last 40 years and that's that yeah. was a challenge you know for me to extract yeah. as you say excavate yeah. yes i spent a lot of time with now junior putting my uh, feet in the sea along with him by the seashore when he was fishing and you know bonding with him because he always used to, we, I always used to go fishing with him in the morning and in the evening. And this is how I instigated it. I said, now remember when you were a little kid, you went in a boat mm. with your Amma. Something happened to the boat. He said, how do you know? And I said, mm. Mm. this is how it started, you know, and he yeah. started. In fact, in that very context, you know, somewhere when you, in one of the stories, when um, there is some kind of a natural evolving of a certain kind of wisdom that comes through you know for instance mm -hmm. never kill 
uh, that fish called bowl. You know, yeah. never, you can yeah. never do that. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. basically their beliefs hmm. and how hmm. they are involved in, um, in a way, conservation of nature. You know, oh, yes. even yes. with turtles, you know, yeah, yeah, and yeah, yeah. all of that is and captured, obviously, in the in the story format, you know, in the mm -hmm. story. So yeah, yeah. it's not yeah. like saying don't do it like there are rules that are worked out, but the rules are inevitably coming out or knitted into the story in a beautiful way. But these stories are obviously told in a very simple fashion. Extremely well, simple. Thanks for knowledge, but that yes. is very dis but that's deceptive. It's very deceptive <laughs> because there is very dense philosophy, for instance, in the first one, the creation mm. myth. Oh, that's I my mean, favorite. I story. love that story. I yeah, love yeah, that story. Yeah. You would you now like Junior story loved it so much. This story yeah. he said this is the biggest love story ever told on this earth. So you would yes. tell me again and again. But you know, Sukrita, you know, they, through these stories, I came to know a lot about nature. For example, the story where the protagonist sleeps at night on the turtle mm. back. I yes. thought this was just a myth, but no, mm -hmm. when I was talking to Pankaj Sekseria, the environmentalist, he told me that there are leatherback turtles in Andaman Sea, which are six to seven feet long. Oh, okay. you know, and this through the stories, I came to know that hunting of big animals in the sea, like turtles, dugong, bullfish, all this is done at night. And you must have yes. read the description that now Junior gave how beautiful the sea looks at night. Yes. Under the stars. Yes. When the, yes. Because when the dugong uh, swims, there are sparkles come out of the body through yes. which they know that this is their hunt. It's so beautiful. It's a little universe in, unto itself. You know? Yeah. And I did and, not know all this. But yeah, I came through yeah. the stories. I it, My knowledge became about the sea so well. In fact, I did not know there were six different kinds of seashores. I, I think Yogi has done a beautiful thing by, I think what they have done is they've given you the illustrations which are Subir so Roy. appropriate. Thanks huh? to Subir Roy, he made Subir very Roy, yeah. illustrations and beautiful this illustrations. And in fact, you know, to come to think of it, I mean, indigenous, um, whether it is there in Andamans or, uh, you know, even in Madhya Pradesh, I've seen that some communities, mm -hmm. how they don't tell the tale without drawing. They always yeah. draw, you know, yeah, certain yeah. things. So it's yeah. both imagistic, pictorial in, in a way, and mm -hmm. in illustrative in another mm -hmm. way. And mm -hmm. in a way, it also explains certain things which may not come into words, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the entire atmosphere is uh, kind of created in that fashion. And I think that's the beauty of the book because there are illustrations apart of also from the photographs that, you know, establish the authenticity of your work with you talking. Thanks to, to Trisha, she things. accepted to publish my photographs also because I wanted people to know that, uh, you know, to see now Junior, me interacting and uh, recording in jungle or in a, my guest house room sometimes yes. there yes. and all kinds of, there's also a story of the last you know, the person who learned Great Andamani's language as a second language by a Karen, mm -hmm. by Pao mm -hmm. Buddha, we used to call him. And he sang mm -hmm. a song which is so beautiful about the herd turtle hunting because mm -hmm. he was very friendly with the king of that time, or you can say chief of the Great Andamani's called Loka. And mm -hmm. he used to go for sea escapades with Loka. Mm -hmm. And he used to, he told us a lot of things about the how the how well was this tribe was in hunting you see would you hunting. like to read a song would you like to read the yeah. song yeah i would like to read a song uh, let's see from this book uh, let's see. Wait. And also, you know, the way you have projected each song, that in itself is wonderful. Because first, it's in the original language, then it's in Roman, and uh, and then in English translation. I have also given the script to the language, which is Devanagari. So songs are given in Devanagari. So, Kritan, let me share with you the whole reason for giving this in Devanagari or Hindi script. Because the great Andamanese children are going to school now. And the... Hmm. Eight language of Andaman Nicobar is Hindi, so they all learn and read Hindi. 
So I, I thought see. maybe they, these songs will make them revive the language. They can read it. They yes. can sing it because yes. they can read. So the first yes. you says is in the Romanization, followed by the mm -hmm. script of Great mm -hmm. and and then English translation. So my translation is very poor, but I tried mm -hmm. my best with the help of my husband Satish, who writes poetry. I don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, this is this goes like this. Nuli debe palte toma eru o bete kom. Nuli debe palte toma eru o bete kom. Ali ali ya ma eru o. Ali ali ya ma eru o. Now, these are very different words nobody can understand, but what it means tide has gone away. Tide mm. has gone away. On this boat, the father comes home. On this mm. boat, the father comes home. Be quiet, be quiet. Ali Ali means chup raho, chup raho, shant raho. Mm -hmm. Be quiet, be quiet. The boat comes, by boat comes the father. And see what a small word or two words, mm -hmm. they have, but the whole phrase, translation is an Eng English whole phrase. Mm -hmm. Ruo means somebody comes by the boat. The whole process of coming by the boat is Ruo. Mm -hmm. So Ali Ali, our my is father. Our mm -hmm. my father grew or father is coming by boat so it says be quiet be quiet by boat comes the father by boat comes the father lovely lovely and yeah. also you know when you were reading it out and the kind of sense of rhythm and oh, the tone yeah. and everything even if you don't know the language the sound creates an atmosphere in itself <laughs> but i know some meaning i didn't say you know <laughs> Anita, I was reading somewhere, you know, because I've always been interested in oral traditions. Mm -hmm. And I was reading somewhere, and then I come across it somewhere. I think, I don't know if you've also said that, but the idea that, you know, language uh, is the natural habitat of language is in sound. Yeah, I think it's I a said beautiful that. State. Yeah. Have you said that? Huh? Yeah, I said so that. Anyway, so I'm true. quoting you then. And, <laughs> okay. uh, and you know, but I really feel that is so true because you know, when I write poetry, even mm -hmm. if in today's context, and I'm writing in English, uh, it's not as if you know you recite in the same way as an Urdu couplet or a Hindi, which has a certain kind of musicality in its own. But even in English, when mm -hmm. I'm writing that poem. In my mind, whether I'm reading it aloud or not, I am wanting to hear it. There is an yeah. auditory aspect of it. I'm yeah. listening to it quietly. And there is what I would I would like to say, there is an architecture of silence within the mind. And to make space there and a habitat for the sounds that it will create. And what is the entry point? How do you come in the center of it, the idea? How does it take shape? Mm -hmm. Sound is very primary to it. Yeah. And I think that is a very important aspect of language. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, we have not paid in our normal education of language and mm -hmm. so-called usual, uh, mm -hmm. you know, kind of education pattern. We mm -hmm. don't give space to that orality. We mm -hmm. don't. It's yeah. more to the written. How do you write? You know. I'm very happy that you raised this. You raised this earlier also. The the dialectics of oral versus written, and mm. uh, the problem is that we are laden by the westernized or the Eurocentric or the westerners westernized concept of mm. education. We did not pay attention much to our oral traditions and orality. Mm. Very few people know that even now there are more than 800 languages which have mm. survived in this country mm. and they have a better survival rate and resilience than our written languages because they have survived for thousands of years mm. and they have survived because of the oral transmission of these languages intergenerationally mm. and oral tradition has a continuity, number one. Mm. Number two, it keeps on evolving, you see, and mm. you know the best. And that's mm. why with Sahit Academy, when I started documenting the oral literature or oral folk literature, I realized what kind of beauty these oral traditions have, which the written literature is not, because written literature is frozen. Once you mm. write it, publish it, that's where it freezes. But mm. oral literature evolves. It evolves with the time, it evolves with the space, because when you migrate or you are going somewhere else, it evolves with the space too. So this kind of ever-changing 
phenomena of folk literature is not taught in schools, unfortunately. And I had suggested to the government of India also to retain and maintain and for survival of these languages, perhaps in the primary education. Very much hmm. children are basically learning rhymes, hmm. are learning Jack and Jill, which is very sorry to hear this. Yeah. So yeah. much to learn from our own culture, own heritage, languages, that oral tradition should be introduced into yes. the classroom in the primary education. And perhaps one of the teachers from the tribal areas can be, I mean, one of the people from the tribal areas can be instituted as teachers. That yes, means they can be the gurus. Uh, yes. <laughs> I remember, you know, Sukrita, let me share with you. Now, Junior, after teaching me, realized that he, his language is revived. And this it's is a, a, it's also it's also empowering. Yes, it it's is. It's very, course. very empowering. Yes, know? of course. Yeah. And now, Junior realized that he can be a very good teacher in Anganwadi, in straight mm. Asia. So he Lovely. requested me to request the administration to allow him to be a teacher. And I did mm. with a request, mm. but we turned it down. Fantastic, yeah. We turned it down yeah. because we had no yeah. such <laughs> oh. oh, Yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. I think we yeah. need to expand our own understanding of this entire phenomenon so that these things are allowed. For instance, in my own cultural diversity book, which we edited for that mm. university. Oh, that's a fantastic And I think you, you reviewed that book, yeah. I reviewed and it and I have given gift to Americans here. So there you are, you know. <laughs> and, the, and you have tribal songs there. Yes. And and you, you know, I, in fact, what I was very interested was, and we prepared e-lessons on that. And why I'm mentioning that is because you have done something similar also. You have done the QR, you know, so that people can listen to the songs. See you the can, song. you can you? see the song. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful yeah. QR code. Uh, thanks to Trisha for this uh, uh, suggestion. And... Uh, yeah. My children are enjoying, you know, listening, watching the videos. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's fantastic. And these things, with thanks to the kind of technology we have, oh, these yeah. things are possible now. Yeah, so yeah. what is what is stopping us from using this kind of material? Yeah. Now, coming back to your, um, you know, uh, the tales or the narratives, mm -hmm. I was just wondering, you know, see, it is said that, and it is true, that tales have uh, a faculty, or, well, they're autotelic, you know. They're mm -hmm. autotelic. They would uh, move mm -hmm. on their own, even if human beings are not moving. So do you think that the tales that you have collected and the tales that these people, some two of them at least, still knew, um, do you think that something similar may have traveled and become something else when by the time it will reach, say, Odisha or Bengal on the other side or from one island to another. Is there any evidence of um, that kind? That the tales, of, for instance, the, the, the very first one, uh, the, the myth of origin, um, the origin myth. Creation right? tale, yeah. So, uh, the creation myth. So it would become something different by the time it reaches, say, Odisha. The shores mm -hmm. of Odisha. I'm sure. Odisha. I'm sure, Sukrita. If this tale travels, it will change. It will definitely mm -hmm. change according to the cultural ethos of the community yeah. which there is. And as you must have realized, you know, and I think I did once mention that uh, I did start collecting after this tale. I st started collecting creation tales from other tribal languages. Yeah. yeah. And I to 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 this day I have made something more than 20, 25, but not many. Mm -hmm. And I re I realized that Great Andamani's creation tale is a unique tale because it's a very complex tale, as you can mm -hmm. see. Yes. But at the same time, it it is a tale which talks about metaphysics, you yes. know, and uh, because the 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 end of the tale is very interesting, which does not match and did not find, I did not find any similarities in any folk tales of other tribes or in Jata Katha also. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. this, this feeling of snapping all the ties to the world where you grew up yes. and brought up. So this yeah, itself yeah. and talking about Panch Bhut, the five elements of life. Yes. Now that not other creation tales really describe these two things. And you see the quality of imagination out there, you know, it's this mm -hmm. imagination is founded in a philosophy 
of yes. human existence. You know, it's founded yeah. in that. Yeah. And in fact, you know, I was just thinking if it if it is written in a particular way when it sort of seems to be in a sophisticated style, but mm-hmm. it's very simple. It's very simple, simply told. But if it is written uh, in a slightly different way, people would venerate it. Literature people would say, oh, this is magical realism, you know. Uh-huh. And you see magical realism in this kind of imagination. You know, when the rope is th- thrown yeah. above the clouds. Yes. And there is it gets that, stuck also. Oh, uh, <laughs> it gets uh, stuck. Yes. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. You. You know? Yeah, it was. I was also uh, completely, mm. uh, you know, taken away by this story. You know, this is such a beautiful story. It also yes. talks about very nice relation. In fact, I asked now, I said, why do you love this story? Because the protagonist creates his own partner. Yes, that's one thing. And he said, yes. "You, you, you said the right thing." Up, ekdam sahi bola. He said because mm. here there's no other creation in Sukrita that you'll find. At least I have not found any where mm. the protagonist creates his own partner. Yes, okay? yes. So here, the, this itself is a very unique feature. Well, and I wish it would. It would have been the other way round. The <laughs> the woman creating a man for himself, you know, I was thinking about that. But anyway, that doesn't matter. But the way it has been done, it's been told very simply. And therefore, what I was also thinking was, you know, but there has to be a whole session on it. Basically, the aesthetics of telling these tales, you know. Okay. The aesthetics of the imagination. Mm-hmm. The telling of it, of course, because there would have been a certain mm-hmm. kind of way in uh, or rather music or or yeah, what yeah. I put it, you know, rhythm yeah. in the telling of it because people yeah. would remember it well then. Yeah. So well, Trisha, uh, I hope you're listening to Sukrita. We are in for another <laughs> session. <laughs> <laughs> so so I think on the whole this has been really a fantastic read for me. And I curse our you know intellectual Brahmanism, I would call it. Yes, you know. Yeah. When or sensitization we, as we say. Yes, yes. And we yeah. don't really um, give a adequate value and respect to this material as mm-hmm. something which incorporates within itself sociology, history, philosophy, and uh, mm-hmm. all of that. And also, you know, within the tale, there is collective consciousness. There is at the same time a sense of the present along with a sense of a past. And yes. that's not just history. Yeah. And not just history, but more than that, it's meta history. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, it's lovely, and I'm sure now uh, the organizers would want me to want us to stop because there be some people asking questions. Oh, good! I would be happy to answer. <laughs> no, really, that needs another session, and we'll do that hopefully soon. <laughs> And thank you so much, Dr. Kumar, and thank you so much, Professor Abhi, for, for such a beautifully engaging conversation, which was very soothing and very thought-provoking at the same time. I don't know how, but yeah. Because mm-hmm. it really made us think about what we're doing with our languages, not just the Andamanis, but our regional languages. Like, I come from a family which speaks Braj, and you do not really have Braj dialect people outside the region. You do not really find somebody speaking Braj in Delhi or Kanpur. Mm. So yeah, that's that's something to think about where we are heading in the name of development, where we are mm-hmm. leaving our languages. Mm-hmm. Nice to know, Ishan. I also come from Braj area. My parents were Braj speakers. And oh, that's don't, great. Call it, don't call it a dialect, please. This was Braj Bhasha. You Braj know, Bhasha. It's a political yes. game that the Bhasha has become a boli and mm. Khadi boli. <laughs> Has become Hindi Bhasha. Yeah. 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 The tragedy down. of our time. And in fact, yes. all these binaries that got created, you know, mainstream yeah. and then periphery and yeah. uh, dialect and Bhasha and all of that, <laughs> I think we need to collapse all that, you know, into, mm-hmm. into non entities. Yeah. <laughs> That's correct. Uh, we have some questions for. Uh, for you, Professor Abhi, and yeah. this. Can I see it on my chat box? Yeah, we. I, I'll show it on the screen also. So okay, I'll just there are so many comments for you that you know, we'll we'll read some of the comments by the uh, by our participant. This is by Lakshmi Kannan. I like the learning curve as I hear and with us talk about the lost language of migrant uprooted people and speak with us complete understanding and concern for the oral tradition. The question is, 
can we know something about their old history from their folk tales like heroic folk tales and eulogies yes <clears throat> we do we do know about uh, the the history but which part of history that uh, depends upon the culture of the community for example i was telling that i came to know that what kind of hunting they used to do you see that's also part of a historic phenomena which they have stopped doing and what kind of uh, what kind of uh, seas they used to cross you know while doing this which they no more do no more do it similarly by folk tales one also has to uh, as i said there is a, some uh, there are various kinds of information i got one there was a streak of cannibalism in the community however they also believed in supernatural powers and cannibalism was considered as part of supernatural power which was looked down upon by the general public so there are two stories which give you a, you know the indication of cannibalism so this is also part of in a way a historical phenomena which perhaps existed but it has been camouflaged in a way that uh, that is considered a supernatural power also so i think anvita if you you know you mentioned this in the book also and how you you constantly said that you know you cannot uh, uh, you know bring them together kali kali and yeah. Uh, yeah. you know the person who is yeah. doing head hunting yeah. the demon or yeah. um, juro you know, juro was person. the name of the lady yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, i think that's uh, also something to do with the way uh, cultures get negotiated or mediated Mm. and the you know or misunderstood at times totally yeah. totally misunderstood yeah. Yeah. so it is an interesting um, uh, basically again another excavation of the scholar has to be done then to work <laughs> out where it's taking you know where it is yeah. coming together where it is different and distinctive so mm -hmm. it's a whole area for uh, for the research for mm. more exploration yeah. Yes. yeah it's 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 interesting that you mentioned dr kumar because you know Uh, you you are an expert of the partition studies and you must have read about languages that were you know uh, that were uh, that are now extinct like the seraiki it was a language yes, yes. in the synth yes. part of uh, the subcontinent yes. yes how do you see that in context of uh, you know remote languages like the andamanese yeah you see uh, seraiki too ultimately you know there were more and more punjabi words that caught into it particularly people who came from that side to uh, you know say the punjab or delhi even in delhi mm -hmm. by the way there is a colony uh, which is of seraiki people people who speak in seraiki you know so there is an idea to congregate together to live together you know so that um, not just the language but also the cultural practices continue to be there so there is a nostalgia for it but you also see the onslaughts of you know uh modernity in a particular way where a certain kind of homogenization is happening and yes. i think partly it has to do with the uh, you know english language and even to some extent hindi you oh, know because oh, these oh, are oh. the languages which are being taught and yeah. um, so therefore uh, all the hetero beautiful heterogeneity that we have it is at that cost you know so yeah. saraiki is only one example but there are so many others even your braj for instance you know well i i mean either we exoticize it and therefore that is also creating a distance you know we exoticize braj for i do i mean i love it and somehow i put it on pedest on the pedestal then i tell myself no it is also the language of ordinariness you know and one has to come to come to terms with that so it's a very complicated uh, phenomenon but i think we need to engage with it far more than we do in terms of creating lesser politics and lesser hierarchical patterns you know some hindi the... writers are doing this experiment sukrita there's a very very interesting novel dukham sukham by mamta kaliya mm -hmm. and, and it's in braj okay. i mean most of it is in braj and it's such a wonderful uh, novel very good oh. novel and it's in a pleasure to read it because Lovely. you can understand braj uh, which is there so mm -hmm. some some authors are experimenting with their uh, yes. heritage languages yes. you know yes. where they come from because mamta yes. kaliya is a punjabi name but she comes from a braj area you know yeah and on, similarly you know like uh, what did uh, fanishwanath renu do yes yes you also yes. created you know anchalik yeah. bhasha for his uh, 
uh, for his novels. So yeah. somewhere, you know, smuggling in your own mm -hmm. what was called as a dialect, but is mm -hmm. actually a whole language, you know, full fledged yeah. language. These are all languages. We don't believe yeah. in this the <laughs> dialectics yes. of the yeah. language yeah. dialect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Uh, moving ahead to the next question. This is by Sagnik Sarkar. His question is, do the oral histories of the 10 great Andamanese tribes still remain distinct culture straight of uh, the individual tribes or have all of them amalgamated into a single broad great Andamanese identity, the hom homogenization mm -hmm. of, of cultures? One, uh, well, to answer your question, Sarkar, the number one, the all the ten tribes and were uh, are no longer there. The most of the tribes and most of the languages died by 1930s before the independence. Only the remains of four languages were there, which I described, and as I said, they were known to me when I reached the Strait Island. However, nobody remembered anything, so I cannot talk about whether they are language has retained any culture because they could not uh, say much. However, now Junior who narrated these stories, I'm sure these are Jero stories because he spoke Jero language. And uh, Boa Senior who sang these songs, which also gives a lot of cultural aspects of the songs, uh, or cultural aspects of the community, was singing in Bo language. So Jero and Bo are the two different languages which are represented in this book. But as I said, the uh, they I call them present great and demonies because there are some words which are not uh, bow. Even in in bows singing, you will uh, you will uh, you will notice a word kala badal somewhere. And I asked her. I said, "Isn't this a Hindi word?" She said, "No, no, no. This is Andamanese word word. But I, I'm sure it is Hindi because it translates as black clouds also." <laughs> So, you know, you do find after all they're living with us and they had been living in this, uh, interacting with the city people. So languages change and that's why I call them PGA, present great Indomanese. But yes, uh, the only the four languages I could come across. And Sare, the, as I said, my the only speaker of Sare was Licho. She died early this, uh, sorry, last year, 2021, 20, in April 2020, not of Corona. But she had multiple problems, and uh, she was uh, she knew Sare, though she spoke very little. And Rapuch is the word from Sare, you know. Mm. She, she told me her grandfather was very close to the Britishers, and in fact, if you see her his photograph, you'll see his photograph, her grandfather's photograph with the British hat. So she told me a lot about Britishers also. So these are the modern great Andamanese people who grew up in post-independent India. Mm. Yeah. So the follow-up question by uh, Sagnik is: Do we find similarities in oral traditions between the Great Andamanese and the Nicobaris, especially no, the Shong not at tribe? All. Not at all. Number one, Nicobaris is a very modern tribe in the sense the history of Nicobaris does not go beyond ten thousand years or maybe less. While Great Andamanese are the uh, founder population of the Southeast Asia and South Asia. Don't ever forget that. They are the mm -hmm. remnants of the first migration out of Africa 70,000 years ago. They are the pre-Neolithic people. Yeah. So mm -hmm. comparison of Great Andamanese with any community, leave aside Nicobari, even with the Jharkhandis, the Santhals, who are the one of the oldest, cannot be made the world apart. Tell me, I would be personally interested in knowing, uh, uh, you know, I mean, my links with Africa are very strong. I was born and brought up in Africa, but not 70,000 yeah. ago, 70,000 years ago. Now, right? So uh, I would be interested in knowing that just as on the um, eastern side of India, on the sea coast, mm -hmm. um, coastal line, you do have the Siddhi tribe, isn't it? Siddhi mm -hmm. tribe, who mm -hmm. it is said that they are from East Africa, you know, they mm -hmm. came from there. And They're in I Gujarat. Don't know, right? I don't know when. Gujarat yes, and also Gujarat. Kerala. Also Kerala. Yeah. Kerala, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would be interested in knowing, I mean, of course, 70,000 years is very, very long. Yeah. But they have been away from the mainland for a very long time. It's, mm -hmm. There has been a certain kind of an exclusiveness about them, isn't it, mm -hmm. living in, on those islands. So are there any African cultural echoes that you see there? In, you see, in the I'm language? Not, number one, I have not studied this tribe that you're talking mm -hmm. about, though I would love to. 
and hmm. because they are still isolated in a way that they have i'm told they have retained their language and culture to some extent hmm. but the andamanis uh, uh, culture is um, i mean they are not very many things so number one they don't paint for example they always tattoo their body hmm. and when i reached the island nobody was tattooing their body except goa senior hmm. you see and it's a painful process but they yeah. do they think it's uh, it's culturally viable and beautiful so mm. uh, the, as far as the african culture is concerned i know very little of africa mm. and uh, when as a linguist i try to compare the language with the african existing african languages especially the ones which are on the western side of africa because i you know the migration yeah. is from north west so but i could not find any but my mm. recent uh, visit to cape town i mm. went to the top mountain which is a very tourist area i saw a sign called mara kele you know mm. and i asked the linguist what does mara kele means and he said this means uh, the island you know mm. the place which i was very intrigued because in andamanese language mara kele means our island we people in another words great andaman mm. see there you are see only one word but i don't i still my linguist will reject this because they they say that no word can sustain for so long you see mm. but mm. what what amazes you the kind of similarity in meanings you know mm. mara mm. kele yeah. also can mean my up uh, we people our land our heart whatever you say they, i cannot ex- get a good word in english or in hindi to translate it but i got the point when they were describing what mara kele was and i'm sure mara kele in cape town that sign board also actually the word pertains to a particular location in the map and that's what struck me immediately so it is it is a place name or it is a place yeah. must be belonging to some people yeah yeah so you never know you know maybe yeah. more intensive research has yeah, to be required so is yeah. we do not know could be a possibility yeah but 70 hunt for yeah. the I think it's a hunt for the primordial. <laughs> yeah. Into this, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Next. Uh, so um, I think those were the questions, and if you allow me, uh, I have got a video of Bo Senior singing a song from the book. Oh wow! Lovely, lovely. That would be the best ending for today's session. Oh, and before we lovely. end, I would just. Uh, acknowledge the work by subir roy as we mentioned in the yeah he's in, a, in the session and i and show a, yeah. a, a, an illustration from the book itself i hope people can see it yeah yeah this is the wonderful uh, work in the bowl the fish yeah and we would also like to thank trisha for giving the idea of using qr codes in the chapters that people can scan and listen to the real conversation the recordings songs that has made this book much more immersive an immersive experience in itself you are in that trip with professor abi to the andamanis and uh, i think this book is an example of modern scholarship when it comes to linguistics and this should be prescribed to students who think history is boring no it's not <laughs> if books are being published like these history can never be boring because you are in there so i'll try to uh, i'll try to play that video for all of us i think this will work लड़ी का दूरे गई लड़ी का दूर
दूरे दूरे फिर से कही आ दूरे लड़ी का दूरे लड़ी का दूरे क्या मतलब हुआ इसका है? क्या मतलब हुआ रहने का जगह ठीक नहीं है फिर से गाइए इसको पूरा गाना बहुत बढ़िया गाना है so that was a song by the boa senior let I think me tell you audience that you know i included in the video the hindi part also so that people know that she was bilingual and her hindi in fact great and mani's don't have a short vowel a uh, so she hmm. instead of nahi she says nahi and uh, this is was an information for people working on the language and that's why alok das my team member who was very good in extracting songs so he is the one who did the main job so thanks yeah. for making this particular video thank you ishan thank you so much thank professor abhi and thank you so dr back. kumar memories thank you thank you lovely thank you. yeah and I'm thank so you so happy. much to the team at niyogi books for having us both the legends on the same screen to, this evening mm -hmm. for helping in curating this session and the book is available on amazon so it's yeah. it's time for you to go and get the book we <laughs> have the book we have read it and we are more certain that you will love this book and you will going you are going to give this book to your children and many more generations to come <laughs> with that we end the session today and thank we'll you. be back again with another with another panel discussion very soon thank you so much and have a great evening ahead thank, thank you sukrita thank you